Hello and welcome to the Short Story Workshop. My name is Mel, I'm here with Matt and Simone. This week we're looking at The Pavilion by E. Nesbitt. It's a horror story about um, four young people who are like on holiday together and things don't go well for the two boys when they decide they're going to dare each other to stay a night in a creepy haunted pavilion. I picked the story because I liked the characters a lot and I feel, thought they were really well characterised in a short amount of time. Um, there was a lot of different tensions between them which come into play later in the story and I like that it has a couple of twists at the end as well. So here is The Pavilion by E. Nesbitt. There was never a moment's doubt in her own mind, so she said afterwards, and everyone agreed that she had concealed her feelings with true womanly discretion. Her friend and confidant, Amelia Davenant, was at any rate completely deceived. Amelia was one of those featureless blondes who seemed born to be overlooked. She adored her beautiful friend, and never, from first to last, could see any fault in her, except, perhaps, on the evening when the real things of the story happened. And even in this matter, she owned at the time that it was only that her darling Ernestine did not understand. Ernestine was a prettyish girl, with the airs, so ir irresistible and misleading, of a beauty. Most people said that she was beautiful, and she certainly managed, with extraordinary success, to produce the illusion of beauty. Quite a number of plainish girls achieve that effect nowadays. The freedom of modern dress and coiffure, and the increasing confidence in herself which the modern girl experiences, aid her in fostering the illusion. But in the 60s, when everyone wore much the same sort of bonnet, when your choice in coiffure was limited to bandeau or ringlets, and the crinoline was your only wear, Something very like genius was needed to deceive the world in the matter of your personal charms. Ernestine had that genius. Hers was the smiling, ringleted, dark-haired, dark-eyed, sparkling type. Amelia had the blonde bandeau and the appealing blue eyes, rather too small and rather too dull. Her hands and ears were beautiful, and she kept them out of sight as much as possible. It was she who, at the age of fourteen, composed a remarkable poem beginning, I know that I am ugly, did I make the face that is the laugh and jest of all and went on, after disclaiming any personal responsibility for the face, to entreat the kind earth to cover it away from mocking eyes, and to let the daisies blossom where it lies. Amelia did not want to die, and her face was not the laughing jest, or indeed the special interest of anyone. Really, life was a very good thing to Amelia, especially when she had a new dress and someone paid her a compliment, but she went on writing verses extolling the advantages of the tomb, and grovelling metrically at the feet of one who was another's, until that summer, when she was nineteen and went to stay with Ernestine at Dory Court, then her muse took flight, scared, perhaps, by the possibility, suddenly and threateningly presented, of being asked to inspire verse about the real things of life. At any rate, Amelia ceased to write poetry about the time when she and Ernestine and Ernestine's aunt went to visit to Dory Court, where Frederick Dory Court lived with his aunt. It was not one of those hurried motor-fed excursions which we have now on call weekends, but a long, leisurely visit, when all the friends of the static aunt called on the dynamic aunt, who returned the calls with much ceremony, a big barouche and a pair of fat horses. There were croquet parties and archery parties and little dances, all pleasant and formal gaieties arranged without ceremony, among people who lived within driving distance of each other, and knew each other's tastes and incomes and family history as well as they knew their own. And at Doricourt life was delightful, even on the days when there was no party. It was perhaps more delightful to Ernestine than to her friend, but even so, the one least pleased was Ernestine's aunt. I do think, she said to the other aunt, whose name was Julia, I dare say it is not so to you, being accustomed to Mr. Frederick, of course, from his childhood. I always find gentlemen in the house so unsettling, especially young gentlemen. And when there are young ladies also, one is always on the qui vive for excitement. Of course, said Aunt Julia, with the air of a woman of the world, living as you and dear Ernestine do, with only females in the house. We hang up an old coat and hat of my brother's on the hat stand in the hall, Aunt Emmeline protested. The presence of gentlemen in the house must be a little unsettling. For myself, I am inured to it. Frederick has so many friends. Mr. Thesiger, perhaps the greatest. I believe him to be a most worthy young man, but peculiar. She leaned forward across her bright-tinted Berlin woolwork and spoke impressively, the needle with its trailing red poised in air. You know, I hope you will not think it indelicate of me to mention such a thing, but... Dear Frederick, you, your dear Ernestine would have been in every way so suitable. Would have been. Aunt Emmeline's tortoiseshell shuttle ceased its swift movement among the white loops and knots of her tatting. Well, my dear, said the other aunt, a little shortly, you surely must have noticed. You don't mean to suggest that Amelia. I thought Mr. Thesiger and Amelia. Amelia, I really must say, no. I was alluding to Mr. Thesiger's attentions to dear Ernestine. Most marked. 
In dear Frederick's place, I should have found some excuse for shortening Mr. Thesiger's visit, but of course I cannot interfere. Gentlemen must manage these things for themselves. I only hope that there will be none of that trifling with the most holy affections of others, which... The less voluble aunt cut in hotly with, Ernestine's incapable of anything so unladylike. Just what I was saying, the other rejoined blandly, got up and drew the blind a little lower, for the afternoon sun was glowing on the rosy wreaths of the drawing-room carpet. Outside in the sunshine, Frederick was doing his best to arrange his own affairs. He had managed to place himself beside Miss Ernestine Mutus on the stone steps of the pavilion, but then Eugene Thesiger lay along the lower step at her feet, a good position for looking up into her eyes. Amelia was beside him, but then it never seemed to matter whom Amelia was beside. They were talking about the pavilion on whose steps they sat, and Amelia, who often asked uninteresting questions, had wondered how old it was. It was Frederick's pavilion, after all, and he felt this when his friend took the words out of his mouth and used them on his own account, even though he did give the answer the form of an appeal. Foundations are Tudor, aren't they? he said. Wasn't it an observatory or laboratory or something of that sort in Fat Henry's time? Yes, said Frederick. There was some story about a wizard or an alchemist or something, and it was burned down, and then they rebuilt it in its present style. The Italian style, isn't it? said the seizure. But you can hardly see what it is now for the creeper. Virginia creeper, isn't it? Amelia asked, and Frederick said, Yes, Virginia creeper. The seizure said it looked more like a South American plant, and Ernestine said Virginia was in South America, and that was why. I know, because of the war, she said modestly, and nobody smiled or answered. There were manners in those days. There's a ghost story about it, surely, the seizure began again, looking up at the dark closed doors of the pavilion. Not that I ever heard of, said the pavilion's owner. I think the country people invented the tale because there have always been so many rabbits and weasels and things round dead near it, and once a dog, my uncle's favourite spaniel, but of course that's simply because they get entangled in the Virginia creeper, you see how fine and big it is, and can't get out, and die as they do in traps, but the villagers prefer to think it's ghosts. I thought there was a real ghost story, the seizure persisted. Ernestine said, a ghost story? How delicious! Do tell it, Mr. Doricourt. This is just the place for a ghost story. Out of doors and the sun shining so that we can't really be frightened. Doricourt protested again that he knew no story. That's because you never read, dear boy, said Eugene to Caesar. That library of yours, there's a delightful book. Did you never notice it? Brown tree calf with your arms on it. The head of the house writes the history of the house as far as he knows it. There's a lot in that book. It began in Tudor times. 1515 to be exact. Queen Elizabeth's time. Ernestine thought that made it so much more interesting. And was the ghost story in that? It isn't exactly a ghost story, said the seizure. It's only that the pavilion seems to be an unlucky place to sleep in. Haunted, Frederick asked, and added that he must look up that book. Not haunted, exactly. Only several people who have slept the night there went on sleeping. Dead, he means, said Ernestine, and it was left for Amelia to ask. Does the book tell anything particular about how the people died, what killed them or anything? There are suggestions, said the seizure, but there, it is a gloomy subject. I don't know why I started it. Should we have time for a game of croquet before tea, Doricourt? I wish you'd read the book and tell me the stories, Ernestine said to Frederick, apart over the croquet balls. I will, he answered fervently. You've only to tell me what you want. Or perhaps Mr. Thesiger will tell us another time, in the twilight. Since people like twilight for ghosts, will you, Mr. Thesiger? She spoke over her blue muslin shoulder. Frederick certainly meant to look up the book, but he delayed till after supper when he went alone to the library, found the brown book, and took it to the circle of light made by the colza lamp. I can skim through it in half an hour, he said, and wound up the lamp and lighted his cigar. The earlier part of the book was written in the beautiful script of the early 16th century that looks so plain and is so impossible to read, and the later pages, though the handwriting was clear and Italian enough, left Frederick helpless, for the language was Latin, and Frederick's Latin was limited to the particular passages he had been through at his private school. He recognised a word here and there, mors, for instance, and pallidus, and sanguini, and pavor, and arcanum, just as you or I might, but to read the complicated stuff and make sense of it. Redrick replaced the book on the shelf, closed the shutters, and turned out the lamp. He thought he would ask the seizure to translate the thing, but then again he thought he wouldn't. So he went to bed wishing that he had happened to remember more of the Latin so painfully beaten into the best years of his boyhood. And the story of the pavilion was, after all, told by Thesiger. There was a little dance at Doricourt next evening. A carpet dance, they called it. The furniture was pushed back against the walls, and the tightly stretched Axminister carpet was not so bad to dance on as you might suppose. And even in those far-off days, there were conservatories. It was on the steps of the conservatory, not the steps leading from the dancing room, but the steps leading to the garden, that the story was told. The four young people were sitting together, the girls' crinolined flounces spreading round them like huge pale roses, the young men correct in their high-shouldered coats and white cravats. Ernestine had been very kind to both the men, a little too kind, perhaps. Who can tell? 
At any rate, there was in their eyes exactly that light which you may imagine in the eyes of rival stags in the mating season. It was Ernestine who asked Frederick for the story, and the seizure who, at Amelia's suggestion, told it. It's quite a number of stories, he said, and yet it's really all the same story. The first man to sleep in the pavilion slept there ten years after it was built. He was a friend of the alchemist or astrologer who built it. He was found dead in the morning. There seemed to have been a struggle. His arms bore the marks of cords. No, they never found any cords. He died from loss of blood. There were curious wounds. That was all the rude leeches of the day could report to the bereaved survivors of the deceased. How funny you are, Mr. Thesiger, said Ernestine, with that celebrated soft low laugh of hers. And the next? asked Amelia. The next was sixty years later. It was a visitor that time, too, and he was found dead, just the same marks, and the doctors said the same thing. And so it went on. There have been eight deaths altogether. Unexplained deaths. Nobody has slept in it now for over a hundred years. People seem to have a prejudice against the place as a sleeping apartment. I can't think why. Isn't he simply killing? Ernestine asked Amelia, who said, And doesn't anyone know how it happened? No one answered till Ernestine repeated the question in the form of, I suppose it was just an accident. It was a curiously recurrent accident, said the seizure, and Frederick, who throughout the conversation said the right things at the right moment, remarked that it did not do to believe all these old legends. Most old families had them, he believed. Frederick had inherited Doricourt from an unknown great uncle, of whom in life he had not so much as heard, but he was very strong on the family tradition. I don't attach any importance to these tales myself. Of course not. All the same, said the seizure deliberately, you wouldn't care to pass the night in that pavilion. No more would you, was all Frederick found on his lips. I admit that I shouldn't enjoy it, said Eugene, but I'll bet you a hundred you don't do it. Done, said Frederick. Oh, Mr. Doricourt, breathed Ernestine, a little shocked at betting before ladies. Don't, said Amelia, to whom of course no one paid any attention. Don't do it. You know how, in the midst of flower and leafage, a snake sometimes will suddenly, surprisingly, rear a head that threatens. So amid friendly talk and laughter, a sudden fierce antagonism sometimes looks out and vanishes again, surprising most of all the antagonists. This antagonism spoke in the tones of both men, and after Amelia had said, Don't, there was a curiously breathless little silence. Ernestine broke it. Oh, she said, I do wonder which of you will win. I should like them both to win, wouldn't you, Amelia? Only I suppose that's not always possible, is it? Both gentlemen assured her that in the case of bets, it was very rarely possible. Then I wish you wouldn't, said Ernestine. You could both pass the night there, couldn't you? And be company for each other. I don't think betting for such large sums is quite the thing, do you, Amelia? Amelia said no, she didn't, but Eugene had already begun to say. Let the bet be off, then, if Miss Mutis doesn't like it. That suggestion is invaluable. But the thing itself needn't be off. Look here, Doricourt. I'll stay in the pavilion from one to three, and you from three to five. Then Honor will be satisfied. How will that do? The snake had disappeared. Agreed, said Frederick, and we can compare impressions afterwards. That will be quite interesting. Then someone came and asked where they had all got to, and they went in and danced some more dances. Ernestine danced twice with Frederick, and drank iced sherry and water, and they said good night and lighted their bedroom candles at the table in the hall. I do hope they won't, Amelia said, as the girls sat brushing their hair at the two large white muslin frilled dressing tables in the room they shared. Won't what, said Ernestine, vigorous with the brush. Sleep in that hateful pavilion. I wish you'd ask them not to, Ernestine. They'd mind if you asked them. Of course I will if you like, dear, said Ernestine cordially. She was always the soul of good nature, but I don't think you ought to believe in ghost stories, not really. Why not? Oh, because of the Bible and going to church and all that, said Ernestine. What was that? said Amelia. That was the sound coming from the little dressing room. There was no light in that room. Amelia went into the little room, though Ernestine said, Oh, don't. How can you? It might be a ghost or a rat or something. And as she went, she whispered, Hush. The window of the little room was open and she leaned out of it. The stone sill was cold to her elbows through her print dressing jacket. Ernestine went on brushing her hair. Amelia heard a movement below the window and listened. Tonight will do, someone said. It's too late, said someone else. If you're afraid, it will always be too late or too early, said someone, and it was Thesiger. You know I'm not afraid, the other one, who was Doricourt, answered hotly. An hour for each of us will satisfy honour, said Thesiger carelessly. The girls will expect it. I couldn't sleep. Let's do it now and get it over. Let's see. Oh, hang it. A faint click had sounded. Dropped my watch. I forgot the chain was loose. It's all right, though. Glass not broken, even. Well, are you game? Oh, yes, if you insist. Shall I go first, or you? I will, said Thesiger. That's only fair, because I suggested it. I'll stay till half past one, or a quarter to two, and then you come on. See? Oh, all right. I think it's silly, though, said Frederick. Then the voices ceased. Amelia went back to the other girl. They're going to do it tonight. 
Are they, dear? Ernestine was as placid as ever. Do what? Sleep in that horrible pavilion. How do you know? Amelia explained how she knew. Whatever can we do? She added. Well, dear, suppose we go to bed, suggested Ernestine helpfully. We shall hear all about it in the morning. But suppose anything happens? What could happen? Oh, anything, said Amelia. Oh, I do wish they wouldn't. I shall go down and ask them not to. Amelia? The other girl was at last aroused. You couldn't. I shouldn't let you dream of doing anything so unladylike. What would the gentleman think of you? The question silenced Amelia, but she began to put on her so lately discarded bodice. I won't go if you think I oughtn't, she said. Forward and fast, auntie would call it, said the other. I am almost sure she would. But I'll keep dressed. I shan't disturb you. I'll sit in the dressing room. I can't go to sleep while he's running into this awful danger. It's he, Ernestine's voice was very sharp, and there isn't any danger. Yes, there is, said Amelia suddenly, and I mean them, both of them. Ernestine said her prayers and got into bed. She had put her hair in curl papers, which became her like a wreath of white roses. I don't think auntie will be pleased, she said, when she hears that you sat up all night watching young gentlemen. Good night, dear. Good night, darling, said Amelia. I know you don't understand. It's all right. She sat in the dark by the dressing room window. There was no sound to break the stillness except the little cracklings of twigs and rustlings of leaves as birds or little night-wandering beasts moved in the shadows of the garden and sudden creakings that furniture makes if you sit alone with it and listen in the night's silence. Amelia sat on and listened, listened. The pavilion showed in broken streaks of pale grey against the wood that seemed to be clinging to it in dark patches. But that, she reminded herself, was only the creeper. She sat there for a very long time, not knowing how long a time it was, for anxiety is a poor chronometer, and the first ten minutes had seemed an hour. She had no watch. Ernestine had, and slept with it under her pillow. There was nothing to measure time's flight by, and she sat there rigid, straining her ears for a footfall on the grass, straining her eyes to see a figure come out of the dark pavilion and cross the dew-grey grass towards the house. And she heard nothing, saw nothing. Slowly, imperceptibly, the grey of the dewy grass lightened, lightened. The grey of the sleeping trees took on faint dreams of colour. The sky turned faint above the trees. The moon, perhaps, was coming out. The pavilion grew more clearly visible. It seemed to Amelia that something moved among the leaves that surrounded it, and she looked to see him come out. But he did not come. I wish the moon would really shine, she told herself, and suddenly she knew that the sky was clear, and this growing light was not the moon's dead cold silver, but the growing light of dawn. She went quickly into the other room, put her hand under the pillow of Ernestine, and drew out the little watch with the diamond E on it. Quarter to three, she said aloud. Ernestine moved and grunted. There was no hesitation about Amelia now. Without another thought for the ladylike and the really suitable, she lighted her candle and went quickly down the stairs, still dark, paused a moment in the hall, and so out through the front door into the grey of the new day. She passed along the terrace. The feet of Frederick protruded from the open French window of the smoking room. She set down her candle on the terrace. It burned clearly enough in that clear air, went up to Frederick as he slept, his head between his shoulders and his hands loosely hanging, and shook him. Wake up, she said. Wake up. Something's happened. It's a quarter to three and he's not come back. Who's not what? Frederick asked sleepily. Mr. Thesiger, the pavilion. Thesiger, the... You, Miss Dovenant. I beg your pardon, I must have dropped off. He got up unsteadily, gazing dully at this white apparition still in evening dress, with pale hair now no longer wreathed. What is it, he said. Is anybody ill? Briefly, and very urgently, Amelia told him what it was, imploring him to go at once and see what had happened. If he had been fully awake, her voice and her eyes would have told him many things. He said he'd come back, he said. Hadn't I better wait? You go back to bed, Miss Delvenant, if he doesn't come in half an hour. If you don't go this minute, said Amelia tensely, I shall. Oh well, if you insist, Frederick said. He has simply fallen asleep as I did. Dear Miss Delvenant, return to your room, I beg. In the morning, when we are all laughing at this false alarm, you will be glad to remember that Mr. Thesiger does not know of your anxiety. I hate you, said Amelia gently, and I am going to see what has happened. Come or not, as you like. She caught up the silver candlestick, and he followed its steady gleam down the terrace steps and across the grey dewy grass. Halfway she paused, lifted the hand that had been hidden among her muslin flounces, and held it out to him with, with a big Indian dagger in it. I got it out of the hall, she said. If there's any real danger, anything living, I mean, I thought... But I know I couldn't use it. Will you take it? He took it, laughing kindly. How romantic you are, he said admiringly, and looked at her standing there in the mingled golden grey of dawn and candlelight. It was as though he had never seen her before. They reached the steps of the pavilion and stumbled up them. The door was closed but not locked, and Amelia noticed that the trails of creeper had not been disturbed. They grew across the doorway as thick as a man's finger, some of them. 
He must have got in by one of the windows, Frederick said. Your dagger comes in handy, Miss Dovenant. He slashed at the wet, sticky green stuff and put his shoulder to the door. It yielded at a touch and they went in. The one candle lighted the pavilion hardly at all, and the dusky light that oozed in through the doors and windows helped very little, and the silence was thick and heavy. Vesager, said Frederick, clearing his throat. Vesager, Halloa, where are you? Vesager did not say where he was, and then they saw. There were low stone seats to the windows, and between the windows low stone benches ran. On one of these, something dark, something dark and in places white, confused the outline of the carved stone. Thessager, said Frederick again, in the tone a man uses to a room that he is almost sure is empty. Thessager, but Amelia was bending over the bench. She was holding the candle crookedly, so that it flared and guttered. Is he there? Frederick asked, following her. Is that him? Is he asleep? Take the candle, said Amelia, and he took it obediently. Amelia was touching what lay on the bench. Suddenly she screamed. Just one scream, not very loud, but Frederick remembers just how it sounded. Sometimes he hears it in his dreams, and wakes moaning, though he is an old man now. And his old wife says, What is it, dear? And he says, Nothing, my Ernestine, nothing. Directly she had screamed, she said, He's dead, and fell on her knees by the bench. Frederick saw that she held something in her arms. Perhaps he isn't, she said. Fetch someone from the house. Brandy, send for a doctor. Oh, go, go, go. I can't leave you here, said Frederick. Suppose he revives. He will not revive, said Amelia dully. Go, 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 do as I tell you, go. If you don't go, she added, suddenly and amazingly, I believe I shall kill you. It's all your doing. The astounding, sharp injustice of this stung Frederick into action. I believe he's only fainted or something, he said. When I've roused the house and everyone has witnessed your emotion, you will regret. She sprang to her feet and caught the knife from him and raised it, awkwardly, clumsily, but with keen threatening, not to be mistaken or disregarded. Frederick went. When Frederick came back with the groom and the gardener, he hadn't thought it well to disturb the ladies. The pavilion was filled full of white, revealing daylight. On the bench lay a dead man, and kneeling by him a living woman, on whose warm breast his cold and heavy head lay pillowed. The dead man's hands were full of green crushed leaves, and thick twining tendrils were about his wrists and throat. A wave of green seemed to have swept from the open window to the bench where he lay. The groom and the gardener and the dead men's friend looked and looked. Looks like as if he'd got himself entangled in the creeper and lost his head, said the groom, scratching his own. How'd the creeper get in, though? That's what I says. It was the gardener who said it. Through the window, said Doricourt, moistening his lips with his tongue. The window was shut, though, when I come by at five last night, said the gardener stubbornly. How did it get all that way since five? They looked at each other, voicing, silently, impossible things. The woman never spoke. She sat there in the white ring of her crinoline's dress like a broken white rose, but her arms were around Thesiger, and she would not move them. When the doctor came, he sent for Ernestine, who came flushed and sleepy-eyed and very frightened and shocked. You're upset, dear, she said to her friend, and no wonder. How brave of you to come out with Mr. Doricourt to see what had happened. But you can't do anything now, dear. Come in, and I'll tell them to get you some tea. Amelia laughed, looked down at the face on her shoulder, laid the head back on the bench among the drooping green of the creeper, stooped over it, kissed it, and said to it quite quietly and gently, Goodbye, dear, goodbye, took Ernestine's arm and went away with her. The doctor made an examination and gave a death certificate. Heart failure was his original and brilliant diagnosis. The certificate said nothing, and Frederick said nothing of the creeper that was wound about the dead man's neck, nor of the little white wounds, like little bloodless lips half open, that they found about the dead man's neck. An imaginative or uneducated person, said the doctor, might suppose that the creeper had something to do with his death, but we mustn't encourage superstition. I will assist my man to prepare the body for its last sleep. Then we need not have any chattering women. Can you read Latin? Frederick asked. The doctor could, and later, did. It was the Latin of that brown book with the Doricourt arms on it that Frederick wanted read. And when he and the doctor had been together with the book between them for three hours, they closed it and looked at each other with shy and doubtful eyes. It can't be true, said Frederick. If it is, said the more cautious doctor, you don't want it talked about, I should destroy that book if I were you, and I should cut down the creeper and burn it and dig up the roots. It's quite evident from what you tell me that your friend believed that this creeper was a man-eater, that it fed, just before its flowering time, as the book tells us, at dawn, and that he fully meant that the thing, when it crawled into the pavilion seeking its prey, should find you and not him. It would have been so, I understand, if his watch had not stopped at one o'clock. He dropped it, you know, said Doricourt, like a man in a dream. All the cases in this book are the same, said the doctor. The strangling, the white wounds. I have heard of such plants. I never believed. He shuddered. Had your friend any spite against you? Any reason for wanting to get you out of the way? Frederick thought of Ernestine, of Thesiger's eyes on Ernestine, of her smile at him over her blue muslin shoulder. 
No, he said, none, none whatever. It must have been an accident. I'm sure he did not know. He could not read Latin. He lied, being, after all, a gentleman, and Ernestine's name being sacred. The creeper seems to have been brought here and planted in Henry VIII's time, and then the thing began. It seems to have been at its flowering season that it needed the, that in short, it was dangerous. The little animals and birds found dead near the pavilion, but to move itself all that way across the floor, the thing must have been almost conscient, he said, with a sincere shudder. One would think, he corrected himself at once, that it knew what it was doing if such a thing were not plainly contrary to the laws of nature. Yes, said Frederick, one would. I think if I can't do anything more, I'll go and rest. Somehow all this has given me a turn. Poor Thesiger. His last thought before he went to sleep was one of pity. Poor Thesiger, he said. How oh, violent and wicked, and what an escape for me. I must never tell Ernestine. And all the time there was Amelia. Ernestine would never have done that, for me. And on a little pang of regret for the impossible, he fell asleep. Amelia went on living. She was not the sort that dies even over such a thing as happened to her on that night, when for the first and last time she held her love in her arms, and knew him for the murderer he was. It was only the other day that she died, a very old woman. Ernestine, who, beloved and surrounded by children and grandchildren, survived her, spoke her epitaph. Poor Amelia, she said. Nobody ever looked the same side of the road where she was. There was an indiscretion when she was young. Oh, nothing disgraceful, of course. She was a lady. But people talked. It was the sort of thing that stamps a girl, you know. Okay, so what did you both think of the pavilion? I liked how catty the narrator was. It added a sense of humour to the story. I'd, and I felt very sorry for Amelia. And I didn't like Ernestine very much. So I liked the story overall. Had some good twists, as you said. It has some odd character moments, which I quite like. Because they seem unconventional. And um, although it seems maybe a little long-winded by modern standards, I still found it very enjoyable and unique. What were the odd character moments you were thinking of? The characters aren't what you would expect in that they are kind of like horror characters in that they're not particularly likable. But then they're also quite specifically aimed at a particular part of society, I think, which you don't see as often in, in horror, at least not as explicitly. Because Ernestine is the kind of person who seems to have been born into good fortune and just holds on to it for her whole life. And this seems more like it leans more into social commentary than what I usually see from the genre, which tends to be more subtle, I think. I do like that line where it's like, Amelia didn't really want to die. Life wasn't that bad. Sometimes people even complimented her dress, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. Like, the voice is pretty unique. That was a mood. I really liked Amelia. It's the one character I consistently liked. She's the protagonist. She's the hero of the story, right? Yeah. What I like about her is that people are all, oh no, you can't go and do that because it would be bad etiquette and people will talk. Young ladies can't just go running around the house at night. No, and she she knows enough that she's so worried that she just does it anyway. And I liked that about her. Just to backtrack slightly. We said that Amelia is the protagonist, but it starts by introducing it almost more as Ernestine's story. It's like her friend and confident Amelia. Um, it kind of sets it as its central focus is on Ernestine, and it only really becomes about Amelia later. Or maybe it just kind of switches between the two a lot, I guess. I feel like it switches to Amelia quite quickly, and I think that it does that on purpose because Ernestine is clearly the one who interfaces with society, right? She's the one that you would speak to. I think the story goes to great lengths to try and paint Amelia as the kind of person who fades into the background. Yeah, definitely. I like that she has her moment in this story, that it becomes about her as it goes along. And she has her moment and she doesn't in that she's very quickly dismissed, isn't she? Like, if they took her seriously in the first half, then, you know, maybe the horror would have been avoided. Yeah, she was the only one to be like, mm, I don't think this is a good idea. It feels kind of unfair what happens to her. Like a lot of horror stories will have a catharsis in that the bad guy gets their comeuppance in the end after all of the horror and whatever else, and the protagonist kind of gets the guy or gets the happy ending, and it just doesn't happen in this case. Well, Thessiger does get murdered by a plant which he wanted to murder his friend. Yeah, but it's not like you sitting there thinking, ha, he got what was coming to him, particularly when it's like 
oh yeah, when she realised that the man she loved was a murderer and you're like, oh no, your happy ending's just gone. It's also in the wrong order to get a catharsis from it because we find out that he was a murderer after he's dead. Yeah. And even then, it's not like direct murderism. It's like, if the other guy had bothered to remember his Latin, he probably would have known. And it's yeah. not like he had to say yes to the deal either. It's not. I know, it's a very convoluted way to murder someone, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but I admire the manipulativeness of him at the same time. <laughs> like He's very resourceful. It's high reward because, you, you know, he would have got away with it too. Yeah, if his watch hadn't stopped. I feel like if you knew you were in like a place of a murder part, though, he'd be a bit more careful. I guess he's not scared of it because he knows the secret. It only needs to eat when it's near its flowering time, which is, was it near dawn every night? So he's like, well, as long as it's not near dawn, I'm safe. But do you not notice when your like watch breaks? Yeah, I guess he just kept looking and it'd be like, no, it's still one. Could have sworn twenty minutes have passed, but I guess it's still one o'clock. <laughs> I guess um, it does mention Amelia loses track of the time. And he was probably expecting his friend to come and wake him up. Yeah, I guess. But that said, still seems like a huge oversight for cunning murderer. <laughs> Well, maybe it really was just an accident. Yeah, because he wasn't, like, beaten by any kind of, like, anything the protagonist did. It was just his own stupidity, which also prevents the catharsis. It's like, instead of beating the protagonist, they trip over a banana peel. <laughs> I quite enjoy that, though. I'm just like, I feel like there is some karma in it. <laughs> also, it feels true to life. Yeah. Sometimes you just make a silly mistake and end up eaten by a plant. Oh, wait, what? <laughs> The world is chaos. Okay, so the narrator, as we mentioned before, the narrator is quite catty towards the characters, especially at the start of the story where she's like, oh, well, Ernestine is one of those girls who, you know, she's not really beautiful, but she can make an illusion that she is. <laughs> but you've met people like that, haven't um, you? Like, it's a really good description. Like, it's very catty, but it's very on point. Yeah. It's so unique. It's such a unique and interesting way to describe someone. I was <laughs> just like, okay. And she kind of has this sort of attitude that she's, she doesn't seem to think very much of any of these characters, in fact. No. I'm not sure if she's just like, they're young and stupid, or if she's like, this happened a long time ago, therefore I'm not really invested, or what? I don't know, I feel like you're not that catty to people you aren't invested in, but anyway. I liked the voice, because it's funny. But also it fits the horror trope, right? If you, horror often has characters that you kind of don't like because it allows you to detach from them and you can see yourself as better than them so that when they get eaten by plants, you can just feel slightly superior. That's generally how horror goes, right? Is it? Is that how you felt in this story? You were like, well, obviously I wouldn't have got eaten by a plant, <laughs> silly teenagers. I mean, kind of. Well, <laughs> maybe not so much. I definitely had that vibe of like, you knew it was a murderous plant. Why would you do that? I mean, it's kind of playing off the dramatic irony that the characters don't know they're in a, in a horror story, but we do. Yeah. So we get to feel smug when they get screwed over. Mostly I just felt wound up that no one was listening to Amelia. Well, that's kind of a trope in a lot of comedy and tragedy as well, isn't it? To have the, I don't know, the jo is it the Joker character or, like, the Jester? Like, you see it in a lot of Shakespearean plays where you have the kind of very insightful character. Who's often also the comedic figure. Oh, the fool. She's the fool. Yeah. Interesting that both the characters who have a lot of knowledge in the situation, either through intuition or from having been able to read Latin, are the ones that turn out unexpectedly by the end. But the other two are kind of what you see is what you get to a certain extent. Yeah, you're right about that. The ones who are kind of in the know are the ones that get the bad endings mm. i suppose so we like the narrator and feel like she adds some humor to this otherwise quite tense story yeah amelia and ernestine are like they're sort of introduced as a contrast to each other because ernestine is the one who's fooled everyone into thinking she's beautiful amelia fades into the background ernestine is the one who's got the attention of the two lads and amelia's I'm, I, I'm sure at one point it says, oh, it doesn't matter who Amelia sits next to or something like that. They're very dismissive. Oh, my heart broke a bit at that line. Poor girl. Again, we've met people like that. Yeah. People who are just kind like, of Like, you fair. don't <laughs> dislike them. You just don't think, oh, yeah. Oh, no, I really want their attention. 
while the narrator makes comments on all of the characters in a kind of derisive way, I thought the comments on Amelia were almost always like societal comments. Like it wasn't really comments on her character, but it was about the way that other people saw her, which I thought was maybe an interesting distinction to try and make us like her a bit more while still maintaining the air of passive aggressiveness. <laughs> I just think of that bit where it describes her um, poet, her angsty poetry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe not then. I think it does talk about that a bit more with her. I guess we like her because she's a bit of an outcast in some ways. She also comes out with some really interesting lines. Like I remember one that really stood out to me, which is a mixture of the narrator who's obviously saying how these people say things and... Um, her lines in that there's a bit where it's like I hate you said Amelia gently and I'm like oh wow that's a very strong thing to come out in such a gentle tone we can just kind of see this level of fed up in that to me at least yeah I had no idea how to read that <laughs> I was like how can I make I hate you sound gentle <laughs> but it was I did really like it as a line like she's not messing around and she's kind of says it in such a resigned way as well it's not I hate you with like a lot of aggression, which is how something like that is usually said. It's more, I hate you. This is the way it is, <laughs> you know? I, I interpret it as kind of like a, oh, you silly boy kind of comment. For me, it was exasperation and exhaustion. And kind of, I hate you, like without bite to it, just very matter of fact. Like it's not directed personally with venom. It's just, I hate you. It's an example of one of my favourite ways to use adverbs is when it directly contradicts the dialogue. It's a really great way of using them. So Amelia and Anastine are contrasting characters in the way that they're drawn in terms of the way society looks at them and the way that the other lads look at them. Um, why is this such an effective way to create characters as like opposites to each other? Because you see this like a lot in fiction. Like You have characters who are almost two halves and then kind of go in together in a set <laughs> why do you think it's so so effective to do that like is it because the contrast draws out their traits more and makes them a bit more distinctive yeah i mean it absolutely highlights the differences between them right mm. because they they bounce off each other and when one person says something the other disagrees and it shows you why they're different if you just have one of these characters on their own they might have an opinion and you'll just go along with it in the absence of other opinions. I think it's important in scenes like when Amelia wants to go find Thesiger and Ernestine is a bit like, she's not worried, she's not fussed at all, she's just like, I'm going to bed. It's frustrating, but the fact that they have such, I guess, different reactions kind of makes you like her more, like Amelia more than Ernestine, who seems a bit detached from the situation and not, not really taking it seriously. I guess another reason why this is good is because you have that inherent conflict in the relationship between your characters, right? I guess they're so opposite. Maybe when Ernestine is is not worried, it makes it harder for Amelia to speak up, right? Because she's thinking, well, Ernestine will think I'm silly for caring about this. And you've got like a little bit of conflict and tension in there already, and you haven't really done anything. And it also... I mean, Ernestine, I think, as you said, is the standing character for society, so it kind of adds that layer of conflict as well in showing how other people will react to what Amelia does, which ups the stakes of whatever's happening. Like, obviously, there's the stake of, oh, no, what if something's happened to them? But then it adds the stake of, oh, no, what if something hasn't? And this is going to end up badly for her. Because if something does happen, there's almost a sense that whatever she does, she'll kind of get away with it because you can see, in hindsight, why she did it, and it can be explained. But if they're all completely fine, then she's just going to get the backlash the next morning of being hysterical and unladylike and various other things. So it's like, oh no, you're up to lose either way here. The scandal of walking around at night in the house. Mm. I thought the witch he, Ernestine's voice, was very sharp. The question was interesting. It suggests that she does have some interest in one of them, but it's never clear which one. Or is it just that she doesn't want Amelia wanting either of them? I think Ernestine likes the attention, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but i also can't read that as a character flaw really like i mean yes i can see why it would be a flaw but it's also quite of relatable same with her not thinking they're in danger like i think it's very easy to dismiss ernestine as being frustrating when we as a reader know that there is going to be danger 
but like both her and the non-dead lad are like well no we don't believe in ghost stories which in most circumstances when you're not in a ghost story is a rational reaction to have okay so if you wanted to use sort of contrasts in your own writing are there any like easy ways to do it is it just a case of deciding a trait and going and now i'm going to make a character who's completely opposite of that <laughs> that's one way to do it i think but it's not the only way because sometimes you can also foil your characters by having them be very similar in many ways but then have one particular trait that is an opposite to each other say for example they want the same things but want it in very different ways or go about very different means to get it like we've talked about amelia and ernestine being foils but then the same can be said for the two male characters who are also set up in that way by the end of the story because of the different ways they kind of go about trying to get ernestine's affections Thank you. I was sure that they were supposed to be foils, the two lads, but I couldn't figure out how. I was like, is it because one of them can't read Latin? Well, he's like the Amelia, isn't he? The, um, Frederick. He's the Amelia of the guys. In the same way Ernestine will kind of go along with Amelia a bit. Um, She'll go along with him a bit, but her attention kind of seems to be more on... Decisure? She does say to him, like, I wish you would tell me the ghost stories. <laughs> but then they do end up together by the end, so... Would you say this story has heroes and villains? Uh, there is kind of an antagonist, but also kind of not. Who's the antagonist? Not Doricot. Um, Fenia? Fessinger. 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 Eugene. Eugene Fessinger. Eugene, okay, I can remember Eugene. Let's go with Eugene. Like, Eugene's probably the most obvious candidate for villainy. But even then, he's just, I don't know. I feel like he doesn't live up to full-on villainy. But he's only a villain after he's dead. Yeah, exactly. Hence, I don't think it's proper heroes and villains. I mean, like, the conflict between Eugene and his friend Frederick is almost side plot. Like, it's not because it's driving the main plot, but it's not the where the main central issue is. Like, it's... It's like if you read a story about which had a hero and a villain in it, but we're not following the hero or the villain, we're following, I don't know, the sidekick. And they're not really having anything to do with the hero and villain, they just kind of stumble on it when it's like, oh no, he hasn't come home. I was thinking about it because that's the most obvious pair of opposites in stories. You have your hero and you have your villain. I think this is a pretty much everyone, everyone sucks here kind of situation. I think Amelia sucks. Less so. But the fact that she seems unable to interface with society is a pretty big problem. Maybe society is the problem. I mean, I'm not saying it's her fault. But... Like, I remember when I was reading, I was thinking kind of, even before we got to the bit where she started acting more protagonist and, like, leading the charge to rescue him, that, like, if we were w reading this in, like, modern times, this would totally be Amelia as the main protagonist, because we love, there was that whole phase when you had the more quiet, unnoticed girl as the protagonist. Like, it almost went out of fashion to have your popular girl as the protagonist for a point. I did kind of want her to come with her knife and, like, Slash the vines and save him. But hey ho. Well, that would have been such a cool story. A different story, but a cool story. But of course, she'd probably still end up in the same situation at the end because fighting off killer plants is not ladylike. Well, maybe like Eugene would have been like, oh no, Amelia is the girl for me. Because there was that bit at the end where, like, or near the end where Frederick was looking at her in like a way he's never seen her before when she's acting all confident. And putting herself into the spotlight. Yeah, I didn't. I did think about that. I was like, wait, he's not gonna change his mind, is he? But then, obviously, we get that flash forwards earlier where he's married to Ernestine. So, what did you think about that, by the way? I quite liked it in the sense that the early half of the narrative set up the question of which one is Ernestine going to choose. So, in that sense, it was nice to get an answer to that question by the end. Yeah, it's good that there's a resolution, at least, to the love triangle. Yeah, like they dedicate too much time for it for me to not want to know how it turns out. It seems quite jarring to me, because it's thrown in at quite a pivotal moment, and then you're suddenly taken forward an extremely long amount of time for, like, a sentence, and then you're brought back again, and it's almost kind of... it's not It doesn't preserve your immersion, really. It almost, like, moves you out of the story for me. It's a bit jolty. I agree. I like that she used the moment where Amelia screamed, but I'm not sure how I... F 
I go back and forth. I'm like, oh, okay, it's quite good to put it there because it kind of, okay, scream, take you back for a breath, then back in again. But also on the other hand, I'm like, why are we suddenly in the future? Why is why is he married now? What? <laughs> I mean, I guess it's a way of trying to show how shocking the scream was. Scream was, but at the same time, it is. I agree, it is an odd way to go out of it. On the other hand, it also it holds a moment of tension for a longer for a moment longer because you don't quite know what she's screaming at. Like you can guess, but adding the extra line makes you wait just an extra bit longer. That's true. The other reason why I think this line is here is because it sets something up for later in the story. Because once we see that line, we know that him and Ernestine are going to get together because that's a fact because we've just seen it. Which then makes something interesting happen later on where he's he's seeing what Amelia's done and, and her grief and he's almost like admires her. He's like, oh, Ernestine would never have done that for me, right? Mm. And that line... Knowing that he's going to marry her anyway, that line is almost kind of sad. And there's some dramatic irony in there. And it makes that part a lot more impactful. So I don't know. I thought the line in terms of execution was kind of clumsy, but I like the effect. It's like the, the spider in your bedroom, right? You like that it catches the flies, but every so often you look at it and you're like, damn, you're ugly. <laughs> well, just stay in your corner, please. <laughs> I wonder why he's like, he must never tell Ernestine. Like, I mean, I guess it's like a gentleman's agreement in that he doesn't want to besmirch his friend's name. But on the other hand, is he not worried that like part of her is just always going to be in love with him because he's the one that like something tragic happened to, so she would never know what happened. Like, should they have decided to go together or whatever? I thought he decided to keep it secret because he didn't want Ernestine to blame herself for what happened because they they were essentially fighting over Maybe her. Maybe <laughs> it would do for good to realise her actions have consequences. Wait, which part are we talking about? Poor Fessiger, he said, how violent and wicked and what an escape for me. I must never tell Ernestine. And all the time there was Amelia, Ernestine would never have done that for me. That same box. Yeah, it's at the end where he's figured out that Fessiger set him up. Fessiger, like, basically reads the book about the weird creeper in the pavilion and then uses it for his own end, or attempts to anyway by having it kill off the competition for Ernestine. Do you think that's a good reveal at the end, or do you think it's just uh, kind of there to justify why he dies and killing him off? I mean, they already had a pretty good reason for him to die, which is that he didn't listen to Amelia and besmirched the good name of this evil, murderous plan. I think it would have been less satisfying if there wasn't some deliberate planning on his part, because it would be a cheap way to resolve the love triangle issue. Like, a love triangle being resolved because one character dies without any, like, by a complete accident. It's a crap. It's a complete cheat. Like, it's Deus Ex Machina. I can't decide how my romance is going to go, so I'm going to bring in a magic murderous plant. <laughs> You're not wrong. No, I, I agree. I do like it. It adds some extra irony and some poetic justice, right? Like, he, he deserves it more. And it makes you rethink their interactions. Yeah. And I like that it means that he died because he dropped his watch, which is such a small mistake. So, you know, it's just, it's kind of more poetic this way. This twist is the reason I like this story so much. <laughs> because I was reading it in this collection of stories about evil plants, I guess, man-eating plants, whatever. And most of them were just like, hmm, there was a strange looking plant and now I cannot find my friend. I wonder what on earth happened to them. <laughs> Holy shit, this plant, could it be alive? Ah! But this story actually did something different, <laughs> for which I appreciate it. It wasn't about the creeper, it was about the people. And I don't know, I just thought that added something special to this story. Mm. Yeah. I mean, also because you, it's already established that he knows what's in the book. He just seems so stupid if he didn't have a scheme. Like, it suspends disbelief a bit too much. If he was ignorant, then it would be different. No, I mean, in any story like this, it's got to be about the people at some point, right? You know, if you're just writing a story about a plant that eats people, it's got to have something to do with the people, because otherwise it's not going to be that interesting. Hmm. The best horror has a psychological element, I think. Yeah. And even if your story is just for fun, it's nice if it's at least commenting on something that could be related to real life in some way. 
like half the stories you love you can't read if you didn't if we didn't already have a cultural conception of something in this case the inspiration was um a paper charles darwin wrote on Venus flytraps writers loved that thing you can see why suddenly there were evil plants everywhere they are creepy I just think it's kind of funny how if you had this kind of story nowadays, it would probably be some comment on climate change, right? Because it was man versus nature. But because I guess this was quite a long time ago, it's not really in, they're not really conscious of that. So it ends up being quite different. The story has like a lot of chaos in it. It's like it's trying to make some comment on not just uh, the characters can't really control what's happening here because this, you know, uh, it's just a bad situation, but also that. They basically have very little agency over anything. Amelia can't stop anyone from going to get eaten by the plant. He only gets eaten because his, his clock happens to break. You know, it's it's the kind of story that's almost hints at the idea that we aren't really in control of our lives, which is such a horror trope. You reckon they would have stopped if Ernestine said stop? Yeah, they probably would. Yes. <laughs> like the one character who has agency just doesn't care. Right. Because they, did, it was a bet, and she said, oh no, you can't bet in front of ladies, and so they didn't make it a bet, they made it a challenge instead. Yeah, which is how he ended up dead. Yeah, so she does have some control over the situation, she just doesn't use it. <laughs> Were you surprised at Amelia's ending? I mean, I was surprised, but it fits the cynicism of the story and the, the themes of it. It kind of gives it that notion, you know, like, some things never change. Nobody will ever listen to Amelia. All the people like her because this has happened before eight times. Seems like it's saying power lies with the pretty and the fortunate and not necessarily the the good people. And that's just kind of how it is and we can't control it. She always asks the boring questions, but actually they're quite sensible questions. Yeah. <laughs> Mia, she literally asks, is it a Virginian creeper? If they'd actually bothered to think about it, it'd have been like, oh, wait, no, that's not a plant we've seen before. Right. She is she is the only smart person here. She is a Cassandra. She suffers so much for it. Okay, Inesbeth. I had a wild time reading about her crazy life. She wrote children's fiction mostly. The Railway Children is one of her well her most well known ones, um, and she wrote a lot of other children's adventure books. Sometimes she's even credited with inventing the children's adventure story, and you know her books were quite tame and sedate and all like picnics in the country and solving mysteries a bit like famous five but older i guess um so it was surprising to me when i read about her personal life and she basically was in a marriage with with three people in it so it was her her husband and her best friend who her husband got pregnant and edith adopted the children of her husband's mistresses oh wow progressive for the time she had three children of her own and she adopted another three that her husband had with other women including alice who lived with them so it was not a peaceful marriage he cheated on her a lot at the time she was she just was like oh well marriage is a bourgeois concept it's fine i don't mind <laughs> but later in life there are a few hints that she did regret the relationship oh god <laughs> that is horrible and it made edith quite rightfully cranky and she had so many children that she didn't keep track of things properly because she was trying to work as well she was she was making her living by selling stories and i think she did some art and things as well so she was making money um to pay for everything I'm not sure what her husband did i think he was a banker maybe um is this why she ended up writing horror stories she's got sick of all the children <laughs> Yeah, well, there was one instance which was, I think, like, completely horrifying. It was her son. He had to have his tonsils out. He had tonsillitis. But Edith forgot to keep track of things. And she forgot to tell him not to eat before having the anaesthetic. And this meant that he died. He choked to death. And she was obviously absolutely devastated by this. But while it was all going down, she yelled, I think, at her husband, why couldn't it have been Rosamund? And Rosamund was her adopted daughter. And Rosamund overheard it, overheard her say that. And from that, she worked out, okay, my mother's not really my mother. And it's this other person who's my 
well, they used to call uh, Alice Auntie Alice, even though she was their mother. It was a really messed up situation. Um, so after that, obviously, Rosamund was not very happy, and I think she left home really young. But um, before that, she had an affair with H.G. Wells. <laughs> yep. Oh, you know, right. the time machine. <laughs> The Invisible Man. <laughs> uh, she tried to elope with him, actually. And he was married at the time as well. He was a married man. They tried to elope. They made it to the station. Uh, Edith's husband and Rosamund's father caught up with them. Punched H.G. Wells in the face. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Poor H.G. Wells. Just drama, drama, drama. <laughs> Some people do seem to manage to lead a very dramatic life somehow. I don't know how they find the time. Was when he came to punch H.G. Wells in the face, did he have like a walking stick? And that's the inspiration for the tripod aliens? Is that how that works? <laughs> I would love it if that was true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the aliens were inspired by Edith Nesbitt's husband. <laughs> uh. Anyway, Edith got sick of him having affairs all the time and she had a few of her own, um, <laughs> including with George Bernard Shaw. Um, but she was, she got quite cranky with him because, uh, he had lots of other lovers as well and he wouldn't, um, consummate the affair. And she was like, you had no right to write the preface if you are not going to write the book, which I thought was an excellent quote. That's a good point. Yeah. You wouldn't get away with that nowadays. Point. You would not. <laughs> she also had a young poet who... Uh, wrote a lot about the way she looked which was a bit unconventional for the time she had short hair and she didn't wear corsets like a lot of the other women did she had a lot of bangles and jangled and jangly jewelry um so she was a bit of a character i think she founded the fabian society with her husband which was like a socialist party um she was very into socialist lifestyle which i'm not really sure what that entails but it was in a lot of stuff I read about her, so it must have been important. <laughs> yeah, so she had pretty much a terrible time, um, but she did remarry later on to somebody who was loyal to her. He was like a, I think he was a boat captain, which was quite cool. So she had a peaceful retirement with him. Um, on a boat? Well, I don't know on a boat. I think they lived in Kent. Oh. <laughs> mm. But after her first husband died, he basically really screwed her over. So it was nice that in the end she managed to find someone a bit more worthy of her. Wow. So th those are just a few highlights from her insane life. I read a lot of crazy things about her. If you were interested, Google her. She's wild. <laughs> so when did she write this story? When did she write this story is a good question. I just wondered if the dying because you broke your watch comment is at all related to dying because you forgot to not eat. <laughs> right. It could have been, I suppose. I'm not sure when that happened. It's not on the wiki. It was on another source that I found. Okay. Well, it's either an inspiration or weirdly prophetic. Yeah. I just thought it was strange that someone well-known for writing children's books had this sort of such crazy personal drama. <laughs> also, who also writes horror at a dark side, like Roald Dahl. I guess so. Yeah. Some of Roald Dahl's stories are horrifying, even though they're for children, mm. though. <laughs> well. well. I mean, the twits. Come on. <laughs> Thank you for listening. You can find all our previous stories and episodes on the shortstoryworkshop.com. If you'd like to contact us on Twitter, you can find me at Figaholic and Matt at... At Matt P. Writer. And Simone. P underscore M underscore cat writer, also known as the modern cat writer. Okay, thank you for listening. We'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye. <laughs>